you really but uh, uh, so uh, the numbers have increased in the last 10 days it's still increasing hopefully it will uh, plateau in a week or two's time that's what we are expecting <clears throat> Uh, so we are going to be some ten o'clock information. Uh, Madan, we are all uh, ready. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. We are all set, sir. Madan delegates lag in Ayara when it tells someone like Marie. Sir, it is just 10 seconds. We are going live. Okay. You can hear me well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are live. Okay. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, friends and uh, seniors. I welcome you all to this edition of AK and CRRT. We will start with the national anthem. Dr. Raj, uh, I'd like to uh, say good morning and a warm welcome to everybody on this uh, webinar and conference call. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all of us for the 73rd Republic Day celebrations, which really represent how uh, strong the democracy is and will continue to grow. Uh, all of you have lived through the last two years of this pandemic and seen 
the significant changes that it has brought into all our lives. With so many lives lost and so many people affected, we all as in our own areas have learned that this pandemic has taught us some new examples of how we need to address and also look for changes in kidney function. So this conference in that respect is an update on what we have learned so that as we go through now this next wave that we are able to manage and take care of our patients in a much better manner than we knew before. So we have put together a significant uh, breadth of topics, invited experts from all over the world to contribute. And I think we look forward to a really exciting session. However, what I would encourage you all to do is as you listen in, is to please put your questions in the chat. We'll try and address these as best as we can in the panel discussions, because I think it is these interactions that will allow us to learn from each other. So thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to a really exciting session over the course of today. And back to Dr. Raj, thank you. Thank you, sir. As Dr. Mehta has uh, told, we are going to learn from each other. The first session will be on epidemiology of AKI in COVID. And we are getting data from people who have actually done original work in this area. That is true with the entire program today. I invite Dr. Srijit Parmeshwaran, who is head of the Department of Nephrology, JIPMER, with data from JIPMER to tell us the epidemiology of COVID from their center. Dr. Srijit. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Mehta as well as uh, Dr. Chakravarti for asking me to be part of this uh, conference today. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, uh, for giving me the opportunity to be part of the study initiated by Professor Mehta, which is allowing me to share our data with you today. Uh, so what I would like to do over the next 15 minutes or so is to share the data uh, which we were able to collect on uh, kidney disease as a whole, as, a, as, a whole, as well as uh, AKI um, uh, in patients with COVID-19 at Jipmar over the last uh, one and a half years or so. Uh, so this will be the brief out outline of my uh, uh, session. Uh, I would briefly like to give you an idea about what exactly happened with regard to COVID-19 in Pondicherry, which is important to understand the data which I am trying to share with you, as well as what exactly we did uh, with regard to COVID-19 care at Jimmer. Uh, then I would be uh, uh, I'll be sharing with you the procedure which we followed in doing the uh, observational study on uh, COVID-19 patients with uh, kidney disease, uh, as well as what exactly we found uh, briefly. Uh, so, uh, the first COVID-19 case in Pondicherry was reported uh, as early as March 2020, but this was in the Kerala enclave of Pondicherry, uh, far away from the, uh, the actual Union territory of uh, the main district of Pondicherry. Uh, with the lockdown starting in May, March 2020, we had actually started uh, working on setting up a, a separate COVID uh, care area in Jipmer. So uh, by mid-April or so, we had a, a separate standalone building with uh, 20, 220 beds uh, in total, out of which around 47 were ICU beds. And we had set up a separate dialysis unit in that COVID block with around uh, seven machines. We had one CRRT machine there, and we had two machines capable of uh, providing sled uh, for patients who are hemodynamically unstable. The first patients, uh, first patient with COVID-19 was admitted in Jibmar on 30th April 2020, but the actual surge in cases uh, here started uh, in around, by around May 2020. Uh, and initially, if you remember, uh, so what was happening was practically every single patient was diagnosed with COVID-19 was being admitted in hospital. Uh, this was true for Jibmar as well. This was uh, as mandated by the government, and not to, it was not left to the discretion of the individual hospitals. Uh, but we were we started the home isolation program in September 2020, which resulted in low risk patients being sent on home isolation and admitting high risk patients. 
we initiated we received an invitation i received an invitation from dr mehta in uh, i think uh, sometime in june uh, asking us to join the global snapshot on covid-19 patients and uh, uh, we went through the ethics committee and all uh, and we started collecting data on 1st july 2020 so we missed around 3 uh, months april may and june uh, of uh, uh, covid-19 patients who were admitted in jipmer subsequently the data is data collection is ongoing even now uh, briefly about what exactly happened because if you if you know you pondicherry is a small place it has a population of around uh, 12 to 13 lakhs and covid care at least to most part of uh, covid pandemic was restricted to two hospitals this is the uh, government uh, medical college called indira gandhi medical college as well as jipmer mm, so these are the only two hospitals admitting patients with covid 19 even though the, there are a lot of hospitals uh, there are many medical colleges private medical colleges in pondicherry uh, this changed during the, the second wave which uh, the delta wave which happened in 2021 but initially the arrangement was that all mild cases were being admitted in the government medical college whereas all people with comorbidities like mm, uh, significant uh, uh, kidney disease heart disease people who had uncontrolled diabetes, diabetes elderly people people who required oxygen or people who in need of uh, icu admission were all being referred to jipmer so there was a uh, referral uh, bias i would say we were getting the sicker patients whereas the uh, most able patients uh, rightly so were not coming to us uh, right from the beginning this changed during uh, the the delta wave which happened in 2021 because everyone everywhere every hospital was full of covid 19 Uh, the entire jipmer uh, hospital uh, practically we had to shut down every other service and we were take, uh, taking care of only covid uh, 19 patients actually the covid 19 care uh, spilled over from uh, the covid block into the main hospital as well as the women and children hospital uh, same happened with the government medical college and the government had to drop in other hospitals five private medical colleges joined in they admitted some dialysis patients and our dialysis facility with eight dialysis machines got overwhelmed uh, with dialysis patients and the government opened a stand alone uh, dialysis center somewhere else uh, in pondicherry uh so uh, this shows the uh, uh, the total number of patients admitted in jipmer at any point of time this actually starts from august this doesn't include july uh, this was around this was the first way we had uh, around say i would say 270 to 60 patients was the peak uh, admission at that point of time But then it rapidly came down and uh, by november uh, till april 2021 we had a small number of uh, cases then the second wave the huge one uh, the delta wave came in and at its peak we had around 570 patients admitted in jipmer alone and this lasted from april to the end of july 2021 uh, and we had a low burn of uh, cases and we have of course the third wave happening right now so uh, i am presenting data from 1st july till 31st august uh, that is around 13 months uh, till the end of the second wave uh, subsequent that is not there one mail, one reason i analyzed like this was in the month of september uh, there is some uh, loss of data uh, because there was a ransomware attack uh, on our it system and uh, the whole hospital information system crashed and we couldn't collect data on patients for about a month uh, but from october we are collecting but i have not analyzed that data so uh, the total number of covid 19 patients patients admitted during this study period from july to august to end of august 2021 was around 11000 i should add that a good number of them uh, were uh, not really sick patients okay if you go with strict criteria many of them may not have needed hospital admission but they were admitted especially in the earlier part of the uh, pandemic uh briefly about covid 19 rt pcr uh, we were doing it right from the beginning we were not the first lab institution to start doing it because we are directly under the icmr and it is a icmr uh, funded lab here uh, the rapid antigen test uh, was rolled out in early 2021 and follow up test for people who had covid 19 for discharge and was not being done we were uh, basically following the symptom criteria and uh, duration of around 10 days for uh, i should de isolating them so what exactly we try to do was we collected prospectively so this is not a retrospective data we have we have prospectively we try to enroll 
all patients with COVID-19 getting admitted in uh, JIPMER uh, from July to 2020. Uh, there was a, there is a renal registry, a rudimentary form of registry which I am running and I had a project assistant working, a girl who was working in that project because the registry practically stopped enrolling patients uh, because we had shut down our other services. She was redeployed into this project and uh, the, the, there was a COVID-19 dashboard on the hospital information system, which had data on most of the patients who were admitted, almost all patients who were admitted in the COVID block, and the individual ICUs actually had Google spreadsheets. This was used to uh, use for handover between shift between the faculty members as well as the residents. So this also, uh, it was quite uh, exhaustive data on this patient. So this allowed us to collect data without actually going and individually seeing these patients, which is not practically possible for the project assistant. And the clinical information was collected by the nephrology resident who was, uh, there was one resident posted there all the time. And all of us, including myself, did COVID duty during the first and the second uh, COVID uh, waves. Uh, so I, I would like to point out there are some gaps in the data because some patients were not referred to nephrology or they were not uh, even the mentioned CKD was not mentioned in the dashboard itself because uh, somebody finds a grad of 1.6, 1.7, they may actually ignore it. And uh, if they don't need dialysis, unless the treating person feels that I need to uh, call the nephrologist for some reason, this was not referred to nephrology and they were not added the dashboard also. So, so there is there is definitely some loss of you know, CKD patients uh, who, uh, but those who need dialysis, those uh, in the ICU are all captured, but there is a possibility that we miss some patients who uh, had CKD and were otherwise stable and uh, were uh, uh, not referred to nephrology. And it's also possible that serial labs were not being done, especially during the second wave, and we could have missed somebody who developed a mild AKI, which didn't require, which was non oligoric and all it's possible that we have missed. So, uh, so let us look at what we found. The total number of patients admitted and enrolled in the study till the end of August was 556. It was around 5% 5, 5 of total COVID admissions. Mean age was around 51, uh, vast majority were male. Uh, and this is the breakup of kidney diagnosis. Uh, AKI was 15%, AKI and CKD was 5.6%, CKD around 50%. So this is the highest group of patients. GN21 uh, and uh, dialysis patients, including uh, hemodialysis and this is basically ESRD, 20%, and there were 24 transplant patients who were admitted uh, till August, uh, end of August 2020. Uh, we know that the burden of comorbidities is quite high, so 54% were hypertensive, 40% had diabetes. I, we did collect data on heart disease, lung disease, liver failure and all, but I, I think this is probably an underestimate for some reason. We have not caught uh, some patients with these morbidities. This, uh, to my mind, are low numbers. Let us look at the critical care component of this. AKI in 20% uh, of our patient population, uh, to 230, that is around 40% of patients with kidney disease required ICU admission. Uh, one third of them required ventilation. This includes non-invasive ventilation as well. This is not uh, purely mechanical ventilation. And 21% uh, required some sort of inotropic support. If you look at the in-hospital outcomes, uh, around 40% died. Okay. And this is very high, of course, but this is not the complete picture. Uh, you will see it when you show the breakup between AKA and ESRD. And 60% went home. Let us look at the AKI data. I have added ESRD data also for comparison. In an ideal situation, what I should be showing you is comparison of this AKI ESRD with people without kidney disease. Unfortunately, I don't have the data on people without kidney disease. Uh, uh, that data is simply not available. So the comparison I don't have. Uh, so total 115 patients with AKI. This includes AKI on CKD as well. ESRD is 100 and uh, 12. The mean age of ESRD was uh, lower compared to AKI. This is uh, this is peculiar to our situation where uh, the mean age of our ESRD population is around uh, in, the, in the 40s, uh, unlike in, uh, probably in the West where it is in the 60s. 
uh, vast majority were male. But look at this. Uh, this is the AKA people. Forty-five percent required RRT. Uh, most of them uh, internal hemodialysis. We did CRRT only in a small number for logistic reasons. It was there that facility was available, but we actually did only a small number. I have not given the number here. It is probably less than ten patients. Uh, 71% of patients with AKI uh, were in the ICU uh, or needed ICU admission at some point of time. They may not have stayed for the entire duration. Uh, 57 required ventilatory support, uh, including mechanical as well as non-invasive ventilation. 40% uh, required some sort of inotropic support and 65% died. That is way too high. I, I'm, I'm keen to know what was the what is the data from other parts of India? But to my mind, this is uh, way too high. I actually, from my experience in working in the ICU, I thought this is actually even higher, uh, maybe 80 90 percent, but uh, this is 65 percent, uh, is what is there. This is the mortality in ESRD was only around 32 percent. Uh, interestingly, if, you know, this 97.3 percent dialysis in ESRD is not, uh, is not. Uh, wrong because some of the patients ESRD who got admitted died before they uh, got dialysis. That is why this figure is not 100%. It should have been ideally 100%, which is not the case. And diabetes in ESRD was only 26%, which is actually higher than our population. If you look at our ESRD population, less than 20% is diabetic nephropathy. Okay. Uh, and there's a very high proportion of CKD of unknown etiology in our region. So this is not uh, unexpected. Uh, this is actually higher than the proportion of diabetic nephropathy in our ESRD population. Another interesting finding, which I, I, I'm, I'm really perplexed. Uh, we did follow up of this patient. Once they get discharged, uh, there is telephonic follow up uh, monthly, which is done. And up to six months, we are supposed to follow up these patients. And it seems quite a few of these patients who were discharged are dying. 30%, uh, this figure looks very high. I would like to really go back and uh, verify these figures. But 30% of AKA patients who survived hospital stay and 40% of ESRD patients who survived with the COVID infection died in subsequent six months. This, I think, is something very, very interesting, which I would, but I, I, I would like to go and uh, check this. So uh, that's about our data. So to summarize, Around 5% of COVID-19 patients admitted Jibmer had some sort of kidney disease. Most common were 71% were CKD or ASRD. 21% uh, of kidney disease was AKI, either AKI alone or AKI on a pre-existing uh, chronic kidney disease. Very high mortality of around 65% uh, for AKI, uh, which is even higher than the mortality of ESRD patients, which stood at around 32%. And they seem to have a high mortality even after surviving the COVID-19 infection. Something very interesting, which I think we need to look at it more carefully. But that's all uh, about the data from Jibber. I would like to thank uh, again, once again, uh, Dr. Mehta uh, for asking us to be uh, part of uh, the global structure study, which enabled us to systematically collect data in a prospective fashion. And that is the data which I'm sharing with you. Hopefully we'll be able to come out with uh, good publications from this data. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chakravarti has his team also for asking me, for giving me this opportunity to share our data with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srijit. Um, as Dr. Mehta mentioned, we will have the questions at the end of the three talks. It is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Girish Kumtekar, who was with us in Hyderabad and then moved to Pune. He will be talking to us about data from West, his own experience from his center. He's presently the head of the Department of Nephrology in Symbiosis Institute. Uh, Dr. Girish, please. Recording in progress. A very good morning to all. Uh, my name is Dr. Girish Kumtekar, and uh, I'll be talking on the uh, epidemiology of COVID-associated AKI, and uh, this experience is from one single center, which is a dedicated COVID center in Western Maharashtra. And uh, this will be uh, just an account of uh, how we how we looked after the COVID patients which we came across, as well as how we uh, face challenges uh, in interpreting the COVID-related problems uh, in vis-a-vis in, 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 uh, uh, 
uh, acute kidney injury that is happening in 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 the covid situations so this is what uh, is my topic today and uh, i'll be uh, then i'll be talking about uh, what was what, what were the manifestations of covid related aki and how we tried to manage them uh, in our scenarios so let us begin uh, with a little bit of introduction so the study duration is of 2 uh, months so two months we can we we monitored all the data which was collected from the uh, hospital records we analyzed all of them and uh, we tried to compile the data and try to find out how many patients had an aki and it was basically meant to see uh, the incidence and severity of aki in patients with covid-19 and what are the impacts of uh, the new onset acute kidney injury in patients with covid-19 uh, vis a vis the outcomes of these patients and uh, uh, are these outcomes affected by the inflammatory markers are they, are they affected by the severity of the covid-19 illness itself and uh, how how to interpret uh, the, the the incidence and severity of aki in, in covid-19 patients so with this background uh, i would like to say that number of patients we studied was almost 457 and uh, we excluded patients in uh, pediatric age group less than 18 and those who were on immunosuppressants we excluded those who were uh, recipients of solid organ transplantation we excluded and uh, people with malignancy we did not uh, we did not include the data in our data set and uh, this uh, study took place for two consecutive months where we studied patients who were admitted with covid-19 only those who were in home quarantine or those who were treated on op basis they were uh, they were excluded from the study and uh, this was the algorithm which was followed by the authorities uh, for admission of the covid-19 patients so i would like to highlight that people with moderate or severe intensity of covid they were only admitted so this study includes patients with covid 19 with moderate or severe disease only people with who were asymptomatic or those who were having a mild or um, uh, not so significant symptoms they or those who were able to be managed uh, in home isolation they are not included in this particular data set so this is our target population patients with moderate to severe disease who required oxygen who uh, who required um, close monitoring who required to, um, to be tested with inflammatory markers and these are the people who we we, we studied for two months uh, in in uh, consecutively and uh, how we define uh, covid 19 associated aki we may abbreviate as covaki and um, The, uh, this happens in patients with uh, rt pcr positivity we did not uh, study for rapid antigen test we we did uh, rt pcr exclusively for all these patients and they were positive uh, the ct value we did not uh, give any importance to it uh, either it is positive or negative that much we looked at and uh, um, covid associated aki will be a diagnosis of exclusion we excluded all those aki who which which happened because of other obvious causes like say volume depletion pre renal aki or a sepsis associated aki where the blood cultures were positive and uh, drug drug induced aki where the, there was a definitive exposure to drugs like aminoglycosides or nsaids or vancomycin all these akis were excluded what remained was uh, definitely an aki which was caused by the covid-19 illness itself so it was like a diagnosis of exclusion and the aki diagnosis obviously was based on the um, um, kedigo criteria where we used two biomarkers creatinine and urine output and in this particular study we did not uh, look at any novel biomarkers like ngal or um, or kim1 or any other biomarker creatinine and urine output that was what we looked at and uh, throughout this um, data set we 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 saw uh, particular uh, we gave particular importance to 
inflammatory markers uh, crp d dimer ferritin uh, interleukin and albumin <clears throat> and we looked at the clinical findings like the stage of aki requirement of oxygen what was the blood gas parameters and what was the nutritional status for nutritional status we we basically looked at albumin we could not uh, as it was a retrospective data that was one of the limitations of this data set that we came to the pre albumin part or the cholesterol part when it comes to comment on nutrition and um, next we looked at patient outcomes uh, they were hard outcomes like death or recovery and other outcomes like persistence of aki uh, dialysis requirement days spent on ventilator days spent in hospital and dialysis requirement after discharge so whether the aki converted into an akd and uh, that that was we were trying to look at and we gave a little importance to the presence of comorbidities like uh, diabetes hypertension obesity and smoking so with with all these parameters uh, we tried to analyze the hospital data set and these are the few findings that i will be telling you uh, shortly so uh, after excluding all other causes of aki in two months uh, we had uh, almost uh, 457 patients and out of which we had uh, 45 uh, patients having acute kidney injury out of which stage 1 were 34 stage 2 was five patients and stage 3 were six patients if we look at the male female uh, distribution in the uh, of uh, cases of aki stage 3 aki was exclusively seen in females there was no stage 3 aki in males so this was one peculiar finding which we could uh, find in this particular cohort uh, stage 1 and stage 2 aki it was distributed evenly almost in um, in male and female patients and um, a little higher proportion of stage 2 aki was seen in males compared to females but overall stage 3 aki was predominantly seen in female patients uh, then we looked at the inflammatory markers the inflammatory markers they are quite significantly elevated in patients with aki compared to patients without aki so if you look at the crp it was elevated in patients with aki though the uh, statistical significance was not very very high compared to ferritin albumin and d dimer um, uh, this particular finding we Uh, this was the first time we saw that the albumin was very less in patients with aki developing in a covid scenario uh, ferritin uh, was high uh, crp was obviously high d dimer was very high so these are all statistically significant uh, rises in inflammatory markers in patients developing aki in covid 19 with uh, with the covid 19 positivity Uh, interleukins the data set was very incoherent so we could not uh, analyze it so it's uh, it's not possible for me to comment on uh, on the significance of interleukin 6 so the inflammatory markers were very high in uh, covid 19 associated aki uh, if we looked at the risk factors so those were the comorbidities and we saw um, uh, little higher incidence of aki in patients with diabetes and hypertension Uh, compared to patients with diabetes and hypertension it was not very significant uh, rise in patients with uh, obesity and smoking this was something different which we could see in our cohort so obesity was not definitely uh, uh, other risk factor in uh, in our scenario to for the patients with covid-19 to develop aki and the uh, patients who were Uh, on treatment for a chronic obstructive airway disease or bronchiolisma uh, aki was higher in these patients but that was not statistically significant so the background uh, chronic illness of the respiratory system uh, was not very significantly associated with uh, development of aki in patients with covid-19 and then we looked at uh, what are the uh, what are the conventional medications that those who, which were associated with development of aki and we could say we could see that corticosteroids uh, use of heparin and use of hcqs was significantly associated with uh, aki compared to the their use in patients so who did not develop an aki 
so mm. those people who received corticosteroids heparin and hcq as they mm. they definitely have uh, a more severe kind of uh, covid-19 illness with uh, with with some ards and with some uh, throm- thrombotic conditions and these are the same people who were more likely to develop aki in covid-19 scenarios uh compared to patients um, in non covid scenarios where we see that uh, use of ac inhibitors and arbs was more associated with development of aki which was not true in a covid 19 scenario so uh, the use of uh, ac inhibitors and arbs was actually um, kind of a protective uh, for development of aki in in patients with uh, covid 19 so that was something new which we could find out uh, as far as antiviral remdesivir is concerned we had a very incoherent data because the use of remdesivir was very very less so uh, it was not possible for us to analyze it statistically so uh, i find it difficult to comment on <clears throat> uh then come to the presentation how did these people present who had an aki associated with covid 19 and uh, obviously they had a severe illness with hypoxia in in particular in, in hypoxia metabolic acidosis uh, but as we can see that uh, patients who had an hypoxia uh, out of them we we can have 70% of people developing an aki so if uh, there is a hypoxia and there is a requirement of oxygen the likelihood of the particular patient developing an aki is uh, is almost 70% so uh, metabolic acidosis is almost the same then both these values are statistically significant and uh, this this only tells us that the more the severe covid-19 lung involvement uh, the kidney involvement is also to the same proportion and probably they are directly proportional to each other that is what uh, we can we can look after it. we can we can analyze the, these things uh for respiratory acidosis um uh, the data was uh, not statistically significant so respiratory acidosis may not be very well associated with an aki that is what uh, i can i can comment on but uh, obviously there is no statistical significance to this observation uh among these people who require dialysis in um, covid-19 related aki uh we could find uh, only five people uh, requiring dialysis over two months so it was only uh, 11% of all all the total number of aki where uh, where dialysis was required so it was a dialysis requiring aki and all these aki's were oliguric so there is uh, oliguria is the most uh, uh, predominant uh, predictive factor for requirement of aki in our scenarios and uh, those who did not require an aki they were obviously non oliguric and uh, we did only intermittent hemodialysis and sled for these patients with aki and uh, we uh, we could uh, uh, we could get get good outcomes for uh, with uh, hd and sled only and uh, as the hemodynamics was very well preserved in all these patients we did not require to do any crrt for these two months um, and uh, as you can see we, we did not uh, offer any uh, cytokine removing filters for any of these patients for these two months out of this 450 patients none was subjected to cytokine removal extra corporeal blood purification with cytokine removal filters like say cytosorb also and uh, if you look at the patient outcomes we can have some hard outcomes like um, um, death and recovery but they, these are the so soft outcomes like um, use of high flow oxygen use of low flow oxygen so patients with aki uh, definitely the requirement of oxygen uh, uh, the requirement of oxygen is is a little high a little on higher side but it was um, it but if you look at the days spent in hospital they are very, very, the difference becomes very very significant because these are the people who are requiring the high flow oxygen for so long so somebody on high flow oxygen for two or three days may behave differently than somebody who is on high flow oxygen for a week or so so uh, the hospital stay was almost uh, 
two weeks for patients developing an AKI compared to a hospital stay of only 10 days for the, someone who is not developing an AKI. Similarly, uh, someone developing an acute kidney injury is likely to stay in the ICU for a week or so. But for somebody de not developing an acute kidney injury, it, it may not be spending more days in ICU, maybe just two or three days. So th th this was statistically significant. So uh, acute kidney injury predicts the amount of time somebody is spending in hospital or somebody is spending in the ICUs. Similarly, days spent on ventilator, uh, they, they are determined by the coexistence of AKI. So, so, so a patient goes on a ventilator because of uh, ARDS or some blood fibrosis or some other causes. But the, but the day spent on ventilator by these patients was higher in those who developed an AKI. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a contributing factor for uh, weaning from the ventilator. So if somebody has an AKI, People, uh, intensivists or the critical care physicians, they will find it difficult to wean them off ventilator compared to those who, who are without AKI. So people without an AKI, they can be weaned off easily in a, say, um, in a two days or three days of ventilation. But uh, those developing an AKI will stay on ventilator for a little more time. That is what we could find out in this uh, two months analysis of uh, COVID-19 associated AKI. Uh, Death was significantly higher. So we we had 12 deaths in this 12 in two months, and out of which nine were having an AKI. So it was like 20% uh, of people developing an AKI, they we could not serve, we could not save them. That is what uh, this data tells us. But those who are not developing an AKI, the survival is almost 99%. So development of AKI uh, brings down the survival to say 80%. And uh, somebody not developing an AKI, the survival becomes almost 99.3%. So it's a huge difference. It was statistically significant. So all that uh, I can uh, assure you that if we, if we are keenly looking at a development of new onset AKI in a patients with COVID-19, uh, it definitely, definitely, uh, has a survival benefit. If you pick up these patients early, then we can uh, deploy some uh, some measures to to prevent and uh, the complications or dialysis requiring stage or even death. And uh, 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 when it comes to discharge uh, post uh, post discharge dialysis, um, out of the six patients who were on dialysis, only one uh, was one developed acute kidney disease because the AKI was persistent. The dialysis requirement went uh, beyond discharge. So we had to bring him for dialysis after discharge in a COVID dialysis unit. And that, that's what only one patient in two months, we could uh, see that he was persistently on uh, in a dialysis requiring state. So uh, with, this, uh, with this analysis, I would like to highlight a few things that uh, COVID-19 associated AKI was observed in almost 10% of admitted patients in these two months. And uh, it is definitely associated with higher mortality, prolonged hospital stay, days spent on ventilation, and higher oxygen requirement. Inflammatory markers are definitely increased in COVID compared to those without a kidney injury. But what was uh, striking in, in this was the albumin. Uh, unfortunately, we could not measure the proteinuria, we could not measure the we could not quantify the protein loss in these patients in urine. So proteinuria, uh, we don't know whether the high, lower albumin in these patients was because of proteinuria or because of the background uh, nutritional state that, that we could not come in. But definitely, uh, though serum albumin is, uh, was observed lower in patients with COVID-associated AKI, which was statistically significant. Uh, the second thing which we could understand was uh, use of AC inhibitors and ARBs was actually protective and uh, which was not associated with any higher incidence of AKI. So this was a uh, little contrary to what we see in non-COVID non, non AKI. And to just to, uh, just to uh, summarize everything, 
covid uh, associated ati affects overall outcomes in patients requiring inpatient uh, inpatient care so by inpatient care i i why i stress on inpatient care because these are the patients with moderate to severe disease so mild disease uh, as we don't have a data we can i can't comment on it but in moderate to severe disease definitely we should be looking for uh, onset of new onset ati uh, in these patients because it uh, definitely is a burden and definitely affects outcomes in patients with covid-19 and higher inflammatory markers and comorbidities they are they constitute the very important risk factor for the new onset aki during the covid-19 illness so that, that is what uh, i i have for today morning thank you so much for your patience thank you so much dr grish for uh, that data and bringing up some very relevant points i now request dr ranjit nayar who is consultant in uh, internal medicine and nephrologist with armed forces presently he is the commandant of military hospital jaipur to share with us data from his own experience and from the military hospital experience both from north and east thank you uh, thank you very much sir i hope i am audible you are audible very clearly yeah. thank you sir uh, at the outset uh, i would like to thank uh, professor chakravarty and uh, professor mehta and the renowned associates for giving me this opportunity to share uh, the data much uh, some of it is mine some of it is from another hospital i would be bringing to you data from two hospitals of the armed forces medical services uh, from the north of the country and the east of the country Uh, from the north of uh, the country in delhi we have a large 800 bedded multi speciality hospital the base hospital delhi cad i would be trying to compare and contrast the similarities and differences between both these hospitals and the two waves after hearing both the uh, the first and the second speaker in my opinion i believe covid behaved extremely differently in the year 2020 and uh, very differently so in 2021 so uh, i have arbitrarily classified them as the first wave till december 31st 2020 and uh, the second wave from 1st of january 2021 to 31st of december 2021 Uh, base hospital delhi cant as i mentioned is an 800 bed multi speciality uh, hospital which was converted into completely converted into a covid care hospital for the entire delhi and cr region like all hospitals of the armed forces medical services it caters primarily to all the members serving members of the armed forces all three services the veterans from armed forces and their dependents which includes their parents their children and their spouses if and when beds were available patients other than this what we call non entitled patients were also accommodated which was a significant number during the second wave from the east of the country uh, from kolkata i bring data this was my hospital till a few months ago uh, the command hospital at uh, kolkata it's a 750 bed multi speciality hospital things were done slightly differently here we uh, allocated 200 beds uh, in a separate block for covid care with a 25 bed icu the clientele was exactly the same for us the release valve was another sister hospital at barakpur which was about 50 kilometers away it is a 250 bedded hospital with all basic specialties and there was a difference in the admission policies of these two regions thanks to this base hospital in delhi was the only covid hospital for all entitled patients in the entire ncr while in the east we had a mixed hospital with a separate uh, wing for covid patients in the first wave till september till the government allowed home isolation it had become mandatory for admitting patients all patients who were covid positive so the armed forces set up covid care centers which had all asymptomatic patients but required quarantine or isolation what was called in those days other than that anyone with mild symptoms or those with poor morbidities were admitted to base hospital however when you look at the east of the country uh, from kolkata only the moderate and severely ill patients found beds in command uh, hospital while the others were all sent to the sister hospital 50 kilometers away both the hospitals are tertiary care but uh, base hospital did have echo kama hospital had echo facilities base hospital has a slightly larger dialysis unit with 20 beds and two crt machines and command hospital calcutta had 14 beds and one crt machine we had to set up a separate dialysis unit uh, within the acute covid care center a fiber dialysis unit was set up in uh, 
base hospital and a three bed dialysis unit was set up in uh, command hospital both these hospitals had in house uh, rt pcr and uh, rapid antigen test uh, facilities the moment they became available they were icmr certified and they were functional from the first week of the pandemic i'll now bring you specific data from northern india in the first wave which is seen these yellow bars a total of a total of almost 8000 patients were admitted while in the second wave only the severely ill because they just couldn't find space the hospital was overwhelmed so the total number of admissions was much less but the patients were far more sick if you see 603 out of 800 8000 odd patients died in the first wave a slightly higher uh, number died but with a much lesser number of admissions interestingly the number of kidney injuries acute kidney injury episodes uh, ak was uh, the same diagnosis was followed Uh, which uh, kdgo says both for serum creatinine and urine output no other biomarkers were used 411 patients out of the 8000 odd admitted suffered from acute kidney injury of varying degrees in the first wave while only 340 cases of aki were documented in the second wave in specific numbers 5% of all admissions had acute kidney injury in some form or the other while 33% of all icu admissions had aki when you compare it with the second wave in the same hospital a higher percentage of all admissions had acute kidney injury but interestingly the overall icu admissions with aki was slightly lesser at about 25% in both the waves the amount of renal replacement therapy was about 10% of all aki patients deserved uh, renal replacement therapy Uh, in the first wave 28 patients were given hemodialysis of which 22 succumbed in the uh, crrt 10 patients received of which 9 succumbed and acute peritoneal dialysis was also done when uh, crrt was overwhelmed 11 patients were given acute peritoneal dialysis and I'm sorry about this and of which 10 patients succumbed similarly Uh, in the second wave 24 patients got hemodialysis of which 20 succumbed all patients who got crrt and acute peritoneal dialysis did not survive when you compare the incidence of acute kidney injury among those people who died among both the waves you will notice a very stark contrast in the first wave almost 50% of all those who died the yellow says uh, shows the yellow bar show you patients with aki versus no aki and these are the 603 patients who died almost 48% of all patients had acute kidney injury among those who died and 122 patients had aki among the large number of survivors but this again had all types of patients from mild to moderate to severely ill in the second wave however in the 612 who died the number of akis were about 25% and the percentage of aki among survivors was slightly higher as compared to the first wave coming to specific uh, percentages 7.5% of all admissions died in the first wave while 11.5% of all admissions died in the second wave the instance uh, incidence of aki among icu admissions was almost similar at 47% and 44% interestingly in the first wave only about half the patients who died had a coexistent aki while in the second wave just about one fifth of the patients who died had aki 1.62% of all survivors of the first wave had aki while for almost 4.5% of all survivors had aki i would try and like possibly try and explain uh, this difference in the incidence of aki among these two waves uh when it comes to the causes of death almost every single patient had severe covid pneumonia with multi organ dysfunction syndrome almost all patients had diabetes and obesity hypertension comorbidities specifically there were two renal transplant recipients among the 600 who died who had received antibody mediated uh, rejection uh, related anti antibody depletion therapies in the recent past there was one patient of atypical hus undergoing treatment who became covid positive and had covid pneumonia there was one patient of malignancy who had been given nephrotoxic uh, drugs in the past and there were two very young women who were pregnant and had covid pneumonia and worsened very rapidly the second wave was not very different again but this time there were three diabetics who developed motor mycosis and there were also three renal transplant recipients who had immunosuppression for various reasons when i come to the data from the east of india now 
you must remember that this hospital took in only the moderate and severely ill patients and had 200 beds as against 800 beds of North India. As expected, the numbers are much lesser, about 500 on both the waves. The first wave, we had 481 and the second wave, there were 509. Interestingly, here again, the first wave showed a very high number of acute kidney injuries, while the second wave, there was much lesser instance of AKI, though the deaths were much higher in the second wave. When comparing the numbers, the, in the first wave, 34% of all the admissions showed acute kidney injury of some degree, while 41.2% of all ICU admissions showed acute kidney injury. I'm so sorry. In the second wave, 16.5% of all admissions showed AKI. It was almost half as compared to the first wave. Even the ICU admissions, there was just about half the number of patients had AKI. And the renal replacement therapy that was offered to these patients was, of course, much higher as compared to the north of India, as against 10% of all the AKI patients, uh, of all AKIs receiving uh, hemodialysis. 34% of the patients were given hemodialysis. Uh, since we had one CRRT machine, we had decided not to commit it to the COVID care and we did acute peritoneal dialysis. 18 patients uh, received acute peritoneal dialysis, of whom eight, 48 patients received hemodialysis. We didn't give said at any time. It was just intermittent hemodialysis. 28 patients succumbed, 20 survived. Of the 38% patients who received renal replacement therapy, 24 received intermittent hemodialysis, of whom 10 uh, succumbed. And of 8 patients who received acute peritoneal dialysis, 5 succumbed. When I compare the incidence of AKI among the patients who died in both the waves, once again, death 1 and survivor 1 talk about the first wave, and death 2 and survivor 2 about talk about the second wave. 80% of those who died in the first wave had coexistent AKI. Uh, what Dr. Srijit was mentioning about the patients who died 65% with AKI in the ICU, I really don't think it's uh, an outlier. This is probably what we've also seen. Uh, ICU patients, much of them died, and most of them had AKI while they were, when they died. On the other hand, the number of survivors, the percentage of AKI was, of course, much less. The interesting part is it's this is literally looking like a mirror image of this. Among the second wave, among those who died, the 140 odd who died, only 38 had acute kidney injury, while a higher proportion of survivors had acute kidney injury as compared to the first wave. So in this way, we lost 21% or 21.4% or of all our admissions, while almost one fourth of all ICU admissions died. In the second wave, it was much higher, about 28% while 33% of all ICU admissions had AKI. Almost 80% of all patients who died had AKI during the first wave, while the second wave showed a much lower percentage at 27%. But among the survivors, if only 6% had AKI in the first wave, it was literally double that in the second wave. The causes of death, again, were not very different. It was severe COVID pneumonia with MODS and comorbidities or various mix and match combinations. One renal transplant recipient in the first wave, two renal transplant recipients in the second wave, and of course, two cases of hypermycosis. We also had four patients with hematological malignancies who had severe COVID pneumonia and then had a progress to death. Uh, I thought I would like to, uh, I would also try and compare the differences between the two waves as what we saw in Calcutta. Uh, because uh, we had a different, uh, this one, uh, in, in, uh, analysis done, the first wave we took in from 1st of April till 15th of February 2021, and the second wave from 1st April to 31st of December. The total admissions, these numbers are slightly different from the earlier ones because they were from 1st of January to 31st of December. Here it is still 15th of February and from 1st of April. So of the 607 patients who were admitted in the first wave, almost 20% died. But of the 480 who were admitted, 27.5% died. This was a statistically significant difference. The mean age was not very different. There was slightly higher number of females in the second wave. We also saw that elderly females were more, middle-aged females were more likely to die. The interesting part is we checked the duration of the onset of symptoms prior to hospitalization among those who died. In the first wave, patients seem to have a slow onset and gradual progression 
of the illness and they presented with symptoms lasting almost 9 days prior to their admission while in the second wave it was literally half that the disease progressed extremely rapidly not just in the individuals but also in the community all the patients who died the average mean duration of stay was 7 and a half days while in the second wave it was almost half at 4 days about one fourth of the patients had absolutely no comorbidities but the other three fourths had various comorbidities in a mix and match. Uh, uh, this one, uh, uh, mix and match proportion. There was about 28% acute kidney injury during the first wave, and about 16% acute kidney injury that was seen in the second wave. This would also show you the bar graph. This bar diagram would show you how the first wave was a nice, smooth, parabolic, normal appearing curve with a gradual rise till August and then a gradual taper off by December. And how the second wave just zoomed out of nowhere in the late period of March and continued till June. If you look at the age distribution, again, the first wave showed a very normal looking curve with a peak around 60 years of age. However, there were a slightly higher number of young people who died in the second wave, which gave a, an, a, a feeling to people that more young people were dying. But the actual thing when we analyzed data was that the overall age of patients who died, the average age was in fact higher than what was there in the first wave. But yes, there were a few higher deaths among the young people. There were a large number of comorbidities in varying proportions, it's single, double, triple, multiple at times, which contributed to the demise of these patients too. So to conclude, in my opinion, uh, and from what I have seen from the, my data in both the hospitals, the first wave was associated with a gradual onset of symptoms and a gradual progression of the symptoms. Patients came uh, after having been at home for much longer. They stayed in the hospital for much longer and hence there were multiple comorbidities and of course they had multiple comorbidities. There were multiple factors which led to a greater incidence of AKI in them. However, because the overall intensity and uh, the speed with which the disease progressed was not very fast, we were able to manage them and the overall low mortality was lower. However, the second wave was very sharp, very short and extremely lethal. It didn't give the very often patients would come and die within 12 or 24 hours. I don't think it, there was enough time for the development of AKI in the patients who died. However, among those who survived, they had been sick for a longer duration of time and hence the survivors had a higher percentage of AKI as compared to the first wave, but the mortality in the second wave was much higher. This is the only possible explanation that I could come up with. Of course, I have multiple limitations. We do not have electronic medical records. All these are taken from our own personal records, which we have kept on our own uh, laptops. So the, not everything is complete. A large possible there is a possibility that a large number of acute on CKDs were included in this cohort because uh, our patients come from very large geographical areas and we were unable to follow these people up after uh, the AKI survivors could not be followed. So we really don't know how many of them acute on CKDs and how many later developed acute kidney disease. The only people whom we actually excluded from this analysis were CKD patients who were on dialysis of some nature. And as you could see, I have already included renal transplant recipients who were having functional grafts. We treated them as AKI and not acute on CKD. I would have to acknowledge the assistance of two of my very dear colleagues, Colonel Sanjay Panda, who is the head of department of nephrology at the base hospital, who very happily shared all this data with me, and uh, my junior colleague at uh, Kamar Hospital, Calcutta, Colonel Jayendra Singh. And of course, uh, no word of gratitude is enough for the team of doctors, my nursing staff, my technicians, housekeepers, and other paramedical staff who have just soldiered on literally through these two waves, which has broken the back of medical care all over the world. On the 73rd uh, Republic Day, I bring you greetings from my hospital and I thank you all once again for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit. Um, that concludes the session on epidemiology. We have heard interesting differences upon us, Dr. Mehta for his comments from whatever data that we have heard. And then I have one or two uh, questions to ask.
Thank you, Dr. Raj, Dr. Sarasirajit, Dr. Klavitskar, and Dr. Nair. There's great uh, presentations in a very broad spectrum of um, presentations of AKI in your institutions. I think that the, the interesting aspect of this is that uh, you see a different percentage of patients developing AKI. And I'm curious as, um, is this, I mean, to some extent, what, what you've all shown is that the, the institutional uh, parameters for admissions were very different yeah. in each of the institutions. Yeah. And also the, when the patients were seen and how they were managed, all that was also very different uh, itself. And so it's, it's kind of a, one of the things that we have to kind of to, to work through over time is to understand is how those, those factors influenced what happened to these patients. So my question to all three of you is, if you were to look at your data and break it down with respect to how many of these patients were community acquired AKI versus how many of them were hospital acquired. So there's two caveats to this. So we are seeing to a large extent that this distinction uh, in non-COVID AKI has become quite, quite relevant. Uh, if you come in with community acquired AKI, you have a better prognosis, you are more likely to go home, you're going to less likely like dialysis. I'm curious if you saw the same pattern with COVID AKI. Um, that that is uh, absolutely correct, sir. That's why in uh, our particular study, we uh, excluded all uh, AKI with uh, obvious causes, and um, in that regard, the survival was very less in COVID-associated AKI. So, uh, COVID-associated AKI to us was a, a diagnosis of exclusion. Like those with uh, community-acquired AKI, uh, they did well. And those with uh, new onset AKI during the hospitalization, they had a not so good course. But, but maybe I'm uh, just to maybe uh, clarify the question. So if you if you take patients who have COVID and they come into the hospital, how many of them at presentation or within the first 24 hours or within the first 48 hours meet a definition of AKI would be potentially classified as community acquired versus those who are in the hospital do not come in with relatively stable kidney function and then deteriorate would be hospital acquired. So have you looked at your data sets with that differentiation? Uh, yes, sir, we did look. So community acquired AKI, we, 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 we diagnosed it as an AKI on admission or within 48 hours of admission. So that was almost 36%. But the new onset AKI, which developed after the admission or after 48 hours of admission was 11%, 10.6% to be precise. And those were the people who did not do well. But of the 36%, was there also COVID? Or was that all comers of AKI? No, sir. They were all COVID. They were all COVID. So you already see a distinction between yes, community sir. versus this. Yes. Okay. Sir. So I'm curious as to Dr. Nair and Dr. Parmeswaran, what do you find? I think it's Dr. Parmeswaran first. Seriously? Uh, sure, sir. So, uh, uh, Obviously, I have not specifically analyzed this data. It's possible to do that, but I have. I, I can't give you the exact data, but uh, I think there is a distinction. What we have found is actually uh, there is a component of community acquired AKI, which I think predominantly what we have seen is in two groups. Those people who had pre-existing CKD, when they come with COVID at presentation itself, we are finding that their renal function is worse uh, 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 for some reason. Mm, uh, and they also have worsening renal function in the hospital also, but they come with a uh, worse renal function that uh, they had a baseline uh, what they had earlier. The second group is no, there is something with diabetes in this all these patients. We have had a significant number of patients who presented with severe diabetes or DKA. Those people also came with AKI, a good number of them. 
So uh, I'm, I'm sure there is a component of uh, community activated AKI. Uh, two obvious groups which we have seen uh, during my own clinical experience, I am telling, not from the data, uh, are uh, new onset diabetes or those people who had uh, relatively well controlled diabetes, developing COVID, developing DKA or severe diabetes complications, and coming with AKI. And uh, people who had pre-existing CKD, stable renal function over many years, uh, coming with uh, COVID and at presentation itself, they have a much worse renal function. Some of them require dialysis. Uh, I uh, the outcomes I believe is worse for these two these two groups is pretty bad. But I don't have exact data. This is what I think. I'm I'm sorry. I'm not uh, giving you the exact data. We have not done that analysis yet. Thank you. I I, th I think that's that's fair. I think maybe that's something since you've got a large group and in the analysis we are doing with your data, we are classifying in that. So we should be able to give you some of that feedback in that aspect of things. And uh, I'll, I'll let you know what I don't have it in front of me, but I will. Thank you. Thank you. That'd be great. Dr. Nair, your your experience. Uh, so higher incidence of AKI at the arrival, but then these people also recovered much faster. In the second wave, we saw patients coming very sick, but with relatively well-preserved renal function. And those who died, died very early. And among those who survived, then the AKI began to manifest. So yes, those who come with community-acquired AKI, they do seem to have a better course uh, as far as overall uh, outcomes are concerned. But I really don't have hard data to back it up. I think this would be, I, I would encourage all of you to uh, maybe think about this in a, in a manner which we, uh, I'm, we, we are starting to look at it a little differently, is that when you, um, and again, this is more a, a comment and not a question, because it, it, you, I would encourage you to think about it and see if your data would support it. Third is that they were unknown. So when you have somebody who comes in with renal dysfunction up front, it's in those three buckets that you're starting to see what happens to them. Right? So if you have a known CKD and they have worsened kidney function, then it is a AKI on top of CKD or potentially a progression of the CKD depending upon where you are. If it is unknown and you have kidney dysfunction, be AKD in perspective. So that's just a suggestion. Uh, and I would be really, it would be really, very really helpful for us to learn from that from your end. Yeah, thank you, sir. We have one question um, addressed to Dr. Sandeep. I think what they meant is Dr. Ranjit. Comments on urinary sediments, proteinuria in Kovaki patients. Anyone of you who had looked at urinary sediments and protein loss in the AKA subgroup? No, sir. I, I, my apologies. I would not be able to help you with this. It's too fine a data for me to test. comment on. Okay. Srijit, did you have anybody who have who, whom you looked at urinary sediment and protein loss in the AKA group? Uh, in a small group, sir, not everyone, especially in the second wave, is not being done routinely for all patients, but we have not found significant proteinuria, uh, uh, like unlike, which is reported in some literature. In whatever patients we have done, we have found just like an ATN sort of thing, not significant proteinuria, not much of active sediments. Okay. So in the second session, we will be having a talk on histology, what was found in many of the patients uh, who had a biopsy. So that will also throw up some very interesting uh, findings. So um, most of us think the AKI in COVID could be just a pre-renal or a ATN, but we all now know from the data emerging from across many centers, there are specific lesions which can be seen in this cohort of patients. As Dr. Mehta pointed out, it is likely some of them had an underlying element which got worse with AKI. So you would actually find two different lesions. So that was an interesting learning on epidemiology, whatever we understand as of now. Dr. Srijit, did you want to ask anything? You raised your hand. Yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, ask others, a uh, couple of questions which I had in my mind with, with regard to what we have seen. Uh, like uh, our overall mortality in AKI was around 65%. Uh, but uh, I, I feel if we break it up between those people who were in the ICU and who didn't go to the ICU, it is going to be dramatically different. Uh, uh, from what I did ICU duty for about a an year, and my impression is that uh, no one with AKI uh, who goes on ventilator comes out. 
Okay, there may be an occasional patient who came out. Uh, I really don't think it has anything to do with, um, you know, our lack of care. Okay, I won't say that we are giving uh, top of the world medical care in our government facility, but we have a reasonable quality of care. So uh, I, there's one thing which I would like to know, especially uh, from uh, Dr. Ranjit. Uh, in uh, uh, his experience, that's one thing. The other thing, which is very, very uh, curious, which I am finding, uh, actually, I didn't get time to analyze the whole thing because uh, we had not uh, properly compiled the follow-up data. Uh, we are we are following up these patients, all patients, not only the AK patients, uh, on telephonically. Some of them, there is a lot of loss of uh, follow-up, but we have data on three months, six months, and up to a year for a significant proportion of our patients. It seems that both dialysis and those people with AKA seems to be dying in much higher numbers after they are discharged from the hospital. Uh, because I found it in the out, we have a maintenance dialysis unit of around 25 machines. Yes, I did stand alone attached to our institution. So I looked at the last one and a half years mortality in that unit. Nothing to do with COVID, non-COVID. Uh, so this is significantly higher for ESRD patients itself. So, uh, is it what, uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Mehta, whether there is some data from the West on this follow-up, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know. Thank you. So, uh, we'll take um, an answer to Dr. Rijit's one. Dr. Girish? This is a very, very, uh, very appropriate observation, sir. Patients who came to us with a with COVID, those who were having um, normal renal function and new onset of uh, AKI during COVID, they did they did not do well. So everybody who went on dialysis or went on CRRT or acute onset PD, uh, they just succumbed to the illness. So actually, the re epidemiology gets reversed when it comes to uh, COVID-associated AKI. Those with uh, ESRD, they are actually doing well. Those with new onset AKI, as you said correctly, sir, they are not doing well. We had similar experience with leptospirosis some years ago. Yes. yes. Um, Doc Nair, anything on that particular one? So we have to wrap up. Yes, sir. This. Sir, uh, in whatever uh, was my personal experience with uh, these patients, uh, yes, my uh, surprisingly, my ESRD patients and my renal transplant recipients actually did very well during the COVID waves. And... Uh, uh, the number of, I just lost uh, two patients in the first wave and three in the second wave, uh, while decent follow for about 100 plus. Uh, but I feel what Dr. Srijit was mentioning about patients going to the ICU and having AKI. Most of my patients died with AKI. No one died of AKI. They were receiving renal uh, replacement therapy. But their other problems, their other organ dysfunctions were steadily worsening. And anyone spending more than five or seven days in the hospital was on a tube, was having ventilator-associated pneumonia with multi-organs, uh, uh, multi, uh, uh, how should I say, microbiological sepsis with multiple organisms, which was resistant to many drugs. And we ended up giving uh, nephrotoxic cholestin at times. So I guess uh, the AKI cohort is actually, uh, uh, how should I say, it is it is complicated by many other uh, uh, other issues which harm the kidney and the kidney is just among one of the other organs which suffered because of the primary problem. I really wouldn't say that these patients died with AKI. So AKI probably is a risk marker rather than a risk factor for these patients. Yeah, I understand. And, and I don't have any follow-up of the survivors. As I mentioned, acute on CKD is a problem which I faced uh, on a regular basis. Dr. Mehta, final comments from you and we'll wrap up this uh, session. So I, I think this is a very interesting discussion and I would um, have you also think about one other part of this. So do you think that the patient survival in end-stage renal disease and transplant is conditioned by the fact that they are automatically going to get dialysis because you know they need dialysis and you give it. Whereas those patients who have AKI and you're watching them and you're waiting and saying maybe they'll turn around is that there is time lost and that that differentiates uh, their ability to get better. Yes, sir. I fully agree with you. 
<laughs> Interesting uh, thought, thought provoking. Thank you so much, sir. So we will stop now. It is 11.19 and reconvene at 11.30. So there is a break and the second session will be on the pathophysiology and we have the histology section also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.